He's had more hard luck than most men could stand. The mines was his first love, but never his friend. Mother Jones is a labor leader who in the late 19th century, and especially in the first two decades of the 20th century, gained a national audience by creating this, this image of the grandmotherly figure who looks like your frail old grandma next door, but who speaks like the most radical of labor leaders. She inspired so many people to take action to fight oppression in her time. And she continues, I think, to uh, inspire people to think past the immediate uh, conditions of their life and to see themselves as fighters. Well, it seems you're not wanted when you're sick and you're poor. Mother Jones, in one sense, was kind of the rock star of her era in the early 20th century. I mean, uh, in an age before television and radio, uh, Mother Jones, kind of through word of mouth, was a cult figure, uh, particularly among working people in this country. Where pride is a stranger and doomed is a man. His Mother Jones sums it up herself. She was a hellraiser, and, and she, she was out to uh, champion the cause of working people. Black lung, black lung, oh, your hands I see cold. As you reach for my life and you torture... Mary Harris, uh, who becomes Mother Jones, was born in Cork, Ireland. Um, she always said, or later in life she said, she was born in 1830. Actually, she was born in 1837. But certainly we know for definite that she was baptised on the morning of the 1st of August, um, 1837, in the North Chapel. She was baptised by uh, Father John O'Mahony, and um, her parents were there, Richard Harris, and, and uh, her mother, Ellen Cotter, from a native of Inchigila. We, 99% sure, this is also from the same period. And this would have been the actual baptismal font, Mary Harris, who became Mother Jones's baptizing. Things get a little bit murkier when we talk about her family background. They were probably laborers. Her father was probably a laborer in Cork. There's also uh, probably a farming background, an agricultural background too. We know that her parents were married in Inchigila Parish, in the town of Inchigila which is roughly 30 miles uh, 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 west of Cork. Um, and that means that her mother was probably from Inchigila originally, was probably born there. We're in Inchigila at the Inchigila Village Hall, but this, was built, this building was built in 1818 by Father Holland as a, the first church that was built in the village. And it was here in the 1830s that uh, Richard Harris and Ellen Cotter, Mother Jones's parents, were married. In um, the 9th of February, 1834, and their first son, Richard, uh, was born in Inchigila and baptised in Inchigila. Behind me here is uh, Cowdena, the townland of Cowdena Curra, and uh, on the hill there would be two farms, uh, the Galvin Farm and the O'Sullivan Farm, and I believe that it may be somewhere in, on those two farms because there were a lot of small tenancies on it in the 1820s is where the Cotter family would have lived, Mother Jones's uh, forebears. So we're in Inchigila Old Churchyard and the first church was built on the site in about 1500 by the O'Learys. And we're standing in a line of, of five Cotter memorials and some of them dating back to about 1800. My belief is that most Cotters from our parish would have uh, ancestors buried on these plots. So I would think that uh, the Cotters of Cardinal Curra could very well be represented here in this, this place where we are now. But her father was from the city of Cork. So they're in the county. They seem, the family seems to have connections to both places, a rural, a small, poor rural parish, and to the city itself. Probably they were migrants from Inchigila to Cork, as many people were in Ireland in that era, coming from uh, uh, the countryside into the city. As I say, we don't know a lot about 
the family. We do know that they were in the Shandon area of Cork. Um, we don't know exactly what they did for a living, where she went to school, and that sort of thing. But they were in Shandon. I remember going to Shandon uh, when I was in the middle of writing the book, and, and not because I thought I was going to find a lot of information, uh, because it's, there's not very much historical record that, that remains. People like the Harris family are very poor. There's just not that much you can find out about them. They don't leave diaries. They don't leave a lot of letters, that sort of thing. Um, but I wanted to be there just to wander around and get a sense of the place and, and, and just seeing the lanes and the narrow streets and the working class character of it and, and much of the town plat, of course, is still the same. Uh, you could at least imagine uh, small buildings and so on. You could imagine their life there uh, a little bit um, with, with uh, 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 the bells of Shannon still there, still ringing with, with uh, the, uh, the cathedral. Um, you get a sense of, of their life a little bit. I believe that her first 10 years before her father immigrated in 1847 were the most intact decade of her long life. She lived to 93. But from the time she was born until the time she was 10, she had a home, she had a family, she had a parish, she had a community that was strong and struggled and everything fell to pieces in 1845 with the potato famine and the great hunger. The potato famine devastated so much of Ireland, not just the crops, but so much of the economy. Cork City, uh, between 1845 and 1847, 48, suffered dreadfully from, from the famine. Um, thousands of people uh, died of, of hunger and disease and, and, and the effects of poverty. There, were, there was wholesale um, clearances of people and many thousands were buried in, in new cemeteries around the edge of the city. And uh, it must have been an awful time for uh, a young girl to be growing up in Cork. To have witnessed people dying around her, her friends dying. The, the rattling of the debt carts that were carrying the bodies um, at night, um, where they were collected from, they were left outside the doors and on the laneways and, and streets of Cork. To witness the sickness and the sadness of Ireland at the time surely shaped her outlook on life. Roughly a million people died in those years in the middle of the century. Roughly two million out of a population of something like eight million, maybe a little more, emigrated out, left Ireland. Uh, for Australia, for North America, for England. Her family was, was one, of those, one of those families. The family then decided that they would split up. The father and the eldest son, both called Richard, moved across the Atlantic Ocean. They landed in Canada, but they seemed to have gone south to Burlington, Vermont, and worked in Burlington, Vermont for a couple of years before moving back into Canada to Toronto. In Toronto, they had earned enough to bring the rest of the family across the ocean to join them. And so in 1852, Mary Harris joins her father and her eldest brother in Toronto and enters a new phase of her life. But finally, they settle in Toronto and the family comes over and they make a house, or make a home, I should say. They make a home in uh, Toronto, Canada. And that's where she spends the rest of her uh, youth, her teenage years. She finally, she goes to school there. Becoming educated, that was very unusual for a young woman to become fully educated, prepared to be a teacher. And then she leaves. And we don't exactly know why. We, she's just around 1860, she takes off. And we find her in the town of Monroe, Michigan, just across the lake <laughs> behind me. Um, in, in the, again, in the town of Monroe, and she's a teacher there for a little while. It doesn't stay very long. There's something about it that doesn't appeal, appeal to her. But actually, as she said, she wasn't exactly comfortable with being a teacher because she didn't like bossing little children around. And of course, in those days, that was part of a major part of the job, was not only teaching, but being the authority. So she became a seamstress and became part of the working class world. She went to Chicago and then she moved down to Memphis, Tennessee. We 
don't know when she meets George Jones. It might have been in Chicago, it might have been in uh, Memphis, that she just went down there for some reason. But very shortly, by 1861, she's married to George Jones, a union man, an iron molder, and in Memphis, they have four children. And it looked like she would perhaps have a um, decent standard of living, a decent life. And everything appeared to be going along a conventional, respectable, normal route for, uh, for a woman in the 19th century. After they establish a home and a life in Memphis for years, Mary Jones, now Mary Jones, becomes a mother. George Jones, working as an iron molder, prospering, union man. Uh, um, a yellow fever epidemic uh, uh, strikes Memphis, and, and it uh, kills George Jones and all of their children. Mary Jones is left totally bereft, totally widowed, without children. And she writes in her autobiography about this. She writes about the, the uh, hearing the, uh, uh, the rattling of the death carts in the streets. And you wonder as you read this, is she also talking a little bit about Cork? Is in some ways in her mind going back to the sounds of the famine and the feel of the famine in Cork. She moved back to Chicago. She opened a dressmaking business. Has a shop. And it's as if tragedy is stalking this woman. The famine, the yellow fever. In 1871, the great Chicago fire. And they are burned out in the fire. She describes going to Lake Michigan, as tens of thousands of Chicago's did, to be out of the flames, to just simply try to not die. It's unimaginable. I mean, for me, it's, it's horrifying. And almost everyone could be expected to give up, given all of that bad luck. She, but she didn't see it as bad luck. She saw it as class oppression, and I think that's part of what made her who she was. She saw the famine as class oppression. She saw what happened in Memphis as class oppression. And she saw the Chicago fire, and, the tra and the, of course, the fire hits everyone. But in this case, the people who won out in Chicago were the wealthiest people, and that's exactly what had happened in Memphis. You know, you could escape yellow fever and of course not have your family at risk if you were not among the muck and the poorest. Um, so she took that knowledge and elevated it to a political project. Probably um, after the fire she goes back to dressmaking. And she's in Chicago for a couple of decades, maybe three decades. We really don't know. These are her years in the wilderness. You, you, you can't find her. Now she vanishes. We don't know what happened to her. She went out to essentially, I think, find herself. But she starts showing up as a labor organizer. She talks about in her, in her autobiography how she's involved with these different uh, actions, the, the 1877 railroad strike, the, uh, the Haymarket Affair, but we can't, we can't get close to it, we can't see it. She does start to show up in the historical record in the late 19th century, uh, first with Coxey's Army, a march of the unemployed uh, uh, for jobs, uh, then in the anthracite strikes with the United Mine Workers in the late uh, uh, 1890s. America went through uh, rapid industrialization towards the end of the 1800s. Um, the railroads were being built uh, in the main by, by Irish immigrants and there was a, a, a huge growth in, in, in coal production and mining. Uh, there was a huge pr increase in steel making and generally um, engineering works and uh, like the whole of America was being opened up to rapid industrialization. Um, accompanying that was uh, the growth of the, the labouring and working classes who were working in the mines, in the factories, the, the women were working and young girls were working in the mills and in dressmaking, huge you know, factories full of looms. Um, so uh, a, a growing consciousness of um, the, the, the repression really that the, the labouring classes were suffering at the time was developing. She saw other people around her fighting and she gravitated to the fighters. And perhaps that came from Cork, you know, the rebel city, that uh, she, she was a, a family of fighters. And um, 
she didn't take the sitting down and she looked to inspiration from abolitionist. Uh, one of the things that she carried around in her pocket in the early years, uh, by all accounts, is a copy of abolitionist Wendell Phillips' writings. Um, so she was learning, she was reading constantly, she used her education to think about the question of solving the issue of the conditions of the poor rather than accepting that it was going to happen. So she gravitated to the Knights of Labor, which in those days allowed women a voice. They believed that women were producers, whether or not they were uh, working in the home or working for wages. They were producing the wealth. Their children were wealth producers. Their nursing of uh, the sick was a wealth producer. And so it was a very radical philosophy that said the people produce the wealth and the wealthy take that wealth. They were they are the parasites. That was the wording that was used by the Knights of Labor. And the workers have to take it back because they are producing it. That resonated with her. That made her um, think deeply, I, I guess, about how labor could be structured. And she listened to them. She listened to anarchists in, in Chicago. She listened and she was she gravitated to that movement. And I think she was reborn in finding that voice. And one of the major um, uh, issues that she seemed to keep referring to was the, the, the Haymarket um, incident where um, a number of policemen were killed in a, in a bomb explosion. In just an evening, they loosely, poorly organized event with the hope of getting 20,000 people to the Haymarket. It was, it's, the street was wider here and they figured 20,000 people would come and show up, but only 2,500 showed up. They got on these hay wagons that were right where I'm uh, leaning. For a couple hours, there are speakers. The first speaker is Albert Parsons. He was found on the street with his wife, Lucy. Parsons uh, walking and they said we need you to come to speak at this rally. He didn't even know about the rally. He had just come in from Cincinnati organizing workers there. Uh, just arrived in Chicago. He's with his little son Albert and his uh, daughter Lulu. And it's always so preposterous to imagine that he would have his son and daughter come to a rally where a bomb is going to be thrown, that they somehow plan for a bomb to be thrown. You're going to bring your children and your wife. It, it, it's, it's so preposterous. And there were other speakers, and the last speaker of the night was Samuel Field, a Methodist lay preacher. And he was speaking, and uh, the inspector Bonfield, known as Blackjack Bonfield, who was in the employ of the corporations, because the mayor was not unfriendly to the working class. Uh, and the corporations hired the police to do the strike breaking. The mayor didn't support that, but uh, the mayor went home, and then the inspector had his 176 officers march in and push the workers right up to the hay wagon here and said, he said, I command you in the name of the people to disperse. That's about 1025 at night. There's 250 workers, 176 police. The workers are unarmed and Samuel Field and says, but this is a peaceable meeting. And at that very moment, and uh, people saw an object with a fuse coming from right over this vestibule, about 15 feet away. It was a spherical iron uh, device that had dynamite in it, and it exploded at the foot of one officer, Matthias Deegan, who died from uh, the bomb. The light, the gas light that was right here was blown out, and the police panicked and started shooting. They were the only ones armed. In the end, seven policemen died, six from their own gunfire, one from the bomb, and why our eight workers arbitrarily rounded up? Supposedly, some would say because it was an eye for an eye plus one. The only option for the corporations was to shut it down because of what was happening. Imagine, imagine the idea that you work 12, 14, 16 hours a day and that you were saying, give me the same pay, but I only work eight. That is, that's 
antithetical to the idea of corporate greed and wealth because it was the gilded class. The billionaires of the day could not tolerate that. This became the resting place of those who were executed by the state for not having committed a crime. But as the state's attorney argued in his closing argument, they should be convicted for their ideas. They are no more guilty than the rest of you, as he said in his closing statement to the jury, but convict them for their ideas and keep our society safe. So it was the attempt to destroy this burgeoning labor movement. This is the monument that is the reason uh, that billions of workers every year celebrate International Labor Day, the martyrs of Chicago, the Haymarket Martyrs. Certainly these events, the, the, the railroad strike and the Haymarket, uh, these were important events, not, not just to Mary Harris, to everyone in Chicago, anyone who was interested at all in labor. Um, they were formative events. They, they, they gave people a sense of what was coming, of, of terrible labor strife that was coming uh, to America. And rather than sit passively, she became involved. She increasingly, as she says, started going to lectures, starting, starting to learn about it. And somehow along the way, recognized her capacity as a speaker, as an organizer, as someone who could persuade people about the importance of the union movement. So there was a cascade of movement activity that brought her into um, um, prominence. She, by the 1890s, had recreated herself. In fact, she had forged a brand new identity, the persona of Mother Jones. And she no longer is Mary Harris or Mary Harris Jones. Now she is simply and purely Mother Jones, the mother of the American working class. There are many, many stories of her um, appearing in her Victorian dresses, uh, always immaculately dressed in a bonnet and with her handbag, and uh, literally walking straight down into the mines to uh, meet the miners and then visiting their families and staying with them. Uh, she had no home for about 30 years. She literally slept and, and ate wherever she was. And um, she was adored by the miners because they felt that she was a, a woman who could achieve something for them and try to rise them out of the poverty and the exploitation in which they were. She organized, especially after 1900, she was mostly affiliated with the United Mine Workers Union. She organized in Pennsylvania in the anthracite uh, she organized in the central competitive field in bituminous coal. It was the hand looting years. So instead of having any machine, they used breast augers, heavy breast augers. There was no ventilation to speak of. There were no roof support systems, no roof bolts into the roof. So roof falls were common, explosions were common. There was no way to monitor for methane gas, which is odorless and tasteless. And within a range of five to 15%, it can explode. Miners died by the hundreds and hundreds in those years. They had no union, they had no representation. They were cheated in terms of their wages. They were paid by the amount of coal that they loaded, but the companies would change that amount. They were called the check weighmen. They wanted a, a union check weighman so that they would get paid for the coal that they actually loaded, but they were cheated by usually a third or more. So there was no way to make a living. For coal miners, life was particularly hard. The mining company owned the mines, the mining company owned the land, the town around the mines, especially in places like West Virginia and Colorado. The miners themselves were paid in script they could only use at the company stores, at stores owned by the companies. Their entire lives were controlled by the companies, and so the danger of going out on strike is that you would lose your house, you would lose your livelihood, and then you would 
have nowhere to turn for food and clothing and a roof over your head. So they were terribly brave, the miners who went out on strike. The mine owners, um, uh, in many instances, were, were, were no gentlemen. They had uh, effectively private militias, which they used to protect the, uh, the mines and their, their basically their investments in their businesses. And these militias weren't really subject to the normal rules uh, and, uh, and laws of even the states that they were in. Um, so Mary, Mary, in many instances, defied um, these, uh, you know, there was a number of groups like the Pinkertons and the Baldwin Felt group um, who, you know, were effectively private armies. And uh, Mary was totally fearless. Um, she faced down people with guns. She challenged them to shoot her in many instances. And um, the, the, her bravery, I think, is what attracted a lot of particularly men you know, hard-bitten miners, uh, they could see that she was willing to face down these um, militias. So in, in, they would have, you know, they would have joined in with her and uh, she had a tremendous influence over them. And um, there is the famous story how she got her, um, her name as the most dangerous woman in America in that um, uh, she was sitting in a court one time and an attorney general uh, Reese uh, looked across at her and he said to the judge, there sits the most dangerous woman in America. She's able to crook her little finger and 5,000 men walk off their jobs. And, um, you know, in a way, he was absolutely right. She'd be traveling from mining camp to mining camp, town to town, giving speeches, talking to workers, passing out leaflets. She would go a new place every day. She'd be walking great distances. One, at one point she describes in one of her letters, being in terrible weather conditions, sliding down hills to get from one place to another. It's an old woman doing this, uh, and always saying she was doing it for her boys. The, the really rare and amazing facet of Mother Jones's life is the fact that she did it all at such an advanced age, 62 years old when she started to organize for labor unions. Especially the, the United Mine Workers, but also a more radical Western Federation of Miners. Um, and again, it was using that charismatic personality of her, of hers, her great, great ability with words uh, uh, to persuade people, to ask them, wh why should things be the way they are? Why should workers be exploited the way they are? Um, sh and she would use every trick in the book, belittling people, uh, uh, praising them, whatever it took. She was really quite remarkable. She did so much, but she pushed it. She did not always have the support of the hierarchy at the United Mine Workers. There was one famous period where she was organized the Dishpan Army, where miners' wives went to the coal pit in Pennsylvania and they beat on, you know, beat pans and brought brooms and basically beat up on the scabs and kept the scabs from working in a way that the Union men really could not do. Another aspect of Mother Jones is so important is the example she played for women uh, at her time. You know, Mother Jones encouraged and helped to organize uh, thousands of women uh, in the support of these labor struggles, a role that many women had never seen themselves in before. Uh, they took a very active role, and this was in complete contradiction to kind of the male-dominated unions of their time, that women could play as an important role as, as men played in these struggles for workers' rights. She used all kinds of techniques. She, had, she always said that she loved drama, that drama was what she was after. Um, and she really was very good at it sometimes. And she, she would travel with a, a wind-up gramophone and play music just to stir up a crowd. Um, she, she just had a gift. Uh, uh, and if, if you read her speeches, you get some sense of it. Um, but it's, it's hard to imagine the spoken word, just how good with that slight Irish brogue she still had. She just, she just the descriptions of her as a speaker by, very, by miners, by other organizers, was just how charismatic she was, how she could carry a crowd. Strike until you win. Rise up and strike. If you're too cowardly to fight for your rights, there are enough women in this country to come in and beat the hell out of you. If it's slavery or strike, I say strike until the last one of you drops into your grave. There's one description where, where um, it's, it's described, she's talking to miners from 20 different languages. Miners in America come from everywhere. They come from Central Europe, Southern Europe, African-American. 
And he, this description is that she spoke to them with gestures in French classics, meaning she's gesturing and she's swearing. And they know the swearing words, the English swearing words, and they know the gesturing. And they admire her courage and her, and her, her commitment. And that's what comes across. We only have one speech that's recorded verbatim. It's because detectives were actually taking it down verbatim. They thought she was so powerful. And there you see that the way that she spoke was to engage your audience, not to be above the audience, but to, in a sense, um, bring out their voices as well and to have them respond to her, a kind of call and response. Uh, so it's not a soliloquy as much as it is an interactive uh, a dialogue with the audience. So I think that's part of the power. Um, but it also is uh, humor to bring down the bosses to a level by asking workers why were they so afraid of them? You know, why are these people were no better than they were? And I think that's part of her power too. Well, the highlights would have to be. First of all, the 1902 anthracite strike in Pennsylvania, which was settled successfully. The Miners' Union, the United Mine Workers of America, led by John Mitchell, forced the coal owners, the operators as they were called, to the bargaining table. And the mediator in this negotiation was the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And so that was, I think, a signal achievement for the Union. And it was achieved in part because of Mother Jones Well, the March of the Milchman took place in 1903, and Mary had been concerned for some time about the, uh, the way that young children were being exploited, particularly in, in um, the, the, the mills, and uh, that young breaker boys were operating, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age, were operating in, in, the, in the mines. Uh, the breaker boys used to break up uh, lumps of, uh, of coal and uh, remove any possible stuff that wasn't coal from them. Um, but the problem was really that um, because they spent their youth when they should have been at school, um, they were basically discarded uh, at a very young age and had no schooling, no education. So, you know, Mary was deeply concerned about that as she was about uh, the, the young girls who were working in the mills. So um, in order to highlight the matter, and she was pretty skillful at this, she decided to organise a march of children, of the mill children as it was known as, from uh, Philadelphia to the uh, governor's mansion in uh, New York. Which shone a bright light on the evil of child labor. And she took 40 children and their parents to New York City. They walked to New York City. It took them about 20 days. And when they got to New York City, there was a, a, a large rally for the strike and funds were raised to help with relief of the strikers. But she, Mother Jones, decided that simply achieving Manhattan wasn't enough. And so she took four of the children with her out to Long Island, out to a place called Sagamore Hill, where President Theodore Roosevelt had his summer home, in an attempt to show him firsthand the evils of child labor. These children were, they were sickly, they were puny, they were undersized. She wanted him to see that the youth of the nation was being destroyed by the fact that the mills and the factories and the mines of America were employing children. And it got tremendous publicity. Now, it wasn't always completely successful. There was, uh, there was rain, it was very hot some of the time, it was summer, uh, some, of the, some of the kids got sick. But she got, gained all of this publicity against child labor. Um, and for the, for the strike, uh, by doing this, and also, one of the key things was that the, the notion of meeting with Theodore Roosevelt. Dear Mr. Roosevelt, please meet with us to talk about this national problem. It was, of course, very embarrassing to Roosevelt because all he could do was ignore her. All he, he, the last thing he wanted was to give her credibility, to give the strike credibility. Theodore Roosevelt was no friend of unions. The president wasn't there, she didn't get to see him, but she did make her point, and her point was that child labor was an evil that had to be ended. Child labor continues uh, uh, in, in America into the Great Depression. It's, it's fi finally legislation is passed and the courts don't overturn it, uh, outlawing, child, outlawing child labor, but not until the 1930s uh, after she passes away. But it's part of her legacy that she began this process. The 
Cold War periods from 1912 to 1914 were very, very serious uh, situation that developed where uh, large scale strikes had been taking place, particularly in, in Colorado. And Mary had, had, had become involved in it and she had traveled to many of the, um, the, 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 the mines in the area. Uh, she'd also been um, put in jail on several occasions and in one situation she was, I think, detained for up to three months without trial. Uh, and there were large scale demonstrations of women in particular, uh, you know, organized to get her out of jail. One of the most important strikes that she's uh, involved with uh, is, is the mine strike in, in Colorado um, in 1913-1914. In um, and th this is a violent strike uh, uh, where the uh, miners are thrown out of their company, ta their company towns, their company housing, and they set up tents and they are going through the Colorado winter in the mountains in tents that are supplied by the United Mine Workers. Um, and the strike is grinding on and on. Uh, thousands of people out to strike. Uh, again, many of them immigrants, whole families. Uh, uh, we have photographs of them uh, in these tents. People, uh, you know, just in, in the cold. And she works very hard to keep the strike going, to help them organize. Um, and a particular incident takes place that, uh, a terrible incident, where um, uh, the militia, the state militia, um, basically comes in and uh, the miners had, had armed themselves. They were armed. And the state militia starts firing uh, on them. And they fire back, but finally retreat into the hills. And the militia forces come in and burn what housing they have, these tents. Uh, in Ludlow, Colorado, the famous Ludlow Massacre, this becomes known as. Because when they burned the tents, unbeknownst to them, there had been dug under the tents some shelters for families. And a dozen or so women and children die in the fires that the state uh, militia has set, that the, the uh, militias have set. And this becomes a, a, a terribly important, a terribly embarrassing moment uh, for those opposed to organized labor, to the mine owners. Uh, and a key moment for the organizing of, of labor, that if they'll kill people this way, uh, uh, then we really do have to start thinking about how we defend ourselves. Mother Jones became a nationally prominent labor leader at a time when women labor leaders tended to be localized. She made a name for herself by traveling extensively and she was very well known across the country because of vast press coverage of her. She was great at attracting press attention and it's fascinating that every time she meets a journalist one-on-one, -on -one, the journalist writes about how astonishing it is to meet this woman who's such a firebrand on the stump and who has such a, a thick Irish brogue when she's talking to her boys, but when you meet her one-on-one -on -one, she seems very uh, civilized, very educated, she's very well spoken and very thoughtful. And it's pretty clear that the firebrand was a crucial part of the persona of Mother Jones, but another part of that persona was the Mother Jones who could speak in calm, measured tones, very intelligently to journalists to continue the process of disseminating her message. You know, you can't look at any particular um, strike and say it was a long-lasting victory of that time. These were battles uh, in which the opposition, the moneyed power and the corporate um, uh, leaders were using law and using extra-legal means, meaning uh, corporate mercenaries, private detectives, to undermine every last achievement. So you might have a temporary win that she could have been a part of, but the attempt, the goal of the Mine Workers Union was to, was, um, to organize all workers, and that was a, a, a long-lasting battle. So in other words, you can't look at, oh, she ended child labor. No, she ended, um, she helped workers to fully organize. In the spring of 1917, the transport workers for the local tramway system were trying to win union recognition and went on strike. The um, tramway company, the Bloomington and Normal Street Railway, fired many of them and brought in replacement workers. 
to bolster their spirits on the evening of July 5th, 1917, Mother Jones came to address them. Um, she must have certainly roused the crowd because that evening thousands poured out into the street, actually just a few, just down the street here, um, stopped the tram cars that were operating, picked up paving blocks, threw them through the windows, went down about five blocks from here to the company electric powerhouse, demanded the power be shut down, and uh, basically caused great chaos. The next day, 1,400 National Guard troops, military troops, were brought here and encamped around the grounds of this courthouse. Um, and that afternoon, there was a large railway repair shop here. The railway repair workers marched downtown and circled the troops and said, we may stop the railroad if these workers do not get union recognition. So at that point, the mayor, the union leaders, the local community began to pressure the tramway company, which was owned by a United States congressman, to recognize the workers. And through those negotiations, what was amalgamated association of street and electric railway men and motor coach employees of the United States and Canada, local number 752, was recognized and a contract was signed. And that company still represents the uh, transport workers in this community today. So Mother Jones was the person that looked like a strike that was going to fail. Her spirit and her coming in to kind of fire people up turn that situation around overnight. Bottle washers, uh, again, uh, domestic workers, steel workers. She's active in the 1919 steel strike after the First World War. Early in the new century, in the 20th century, she was one of the first uh, organizers of the IWW. Um, she also worked for the Socialist Party. She organized, after about 1910 or so, she organized for the Socialist Party. She's active until the early 1920s, uh, well into her 80s. But by, by the 1920s, it's partly that she's an old woman, truly an old woman, but it's also that the United Mine Workers has changed. Um, it's become a much more bureaucratic union. John L. Lewis, whom she hates, whom she despises, he's very... He's a great union organizer, but he's a very undemocratic man. Um, and she is very much for union democracy. She wants the workers organizing themselves, thinking about their own uh, futures. That's when she starts to withdraw and is pushed out also, uh, certainly from the United Mine Workers. Um, she spends the last decade, she does some, gives some speeches. In 1925, she collaborates on writing her autobiography. And she more and more spends time with older uh, union men like Terence Powderly, uh, the great organizer of the, uh, of the Knights of Labor, the 19th century union. She drifts back to, as she gets older, to um, Hyattsville, Maryland. There's a family that has a farm and sort of a rest home that takes her in. She's there in the late 20s. And finally, she celebrates what is said to be her 100th birthday on May Day. She says her birthday is, is May 1st. Uh, she celebrates her 100th birthday, she's actually 90, uh, 93 years old, on May 1st, 1930. She gives a little speech. Well, I am considered a Bolshevik and a Red and a W and a Radical. And I admit being all they, I admit being all they charge me with. I'm anything if we change this money civilization to a higher and grander civilization for the ages to come. And I long to see the day when labor will have the destinies of the nation in her own hands, and that she will stand a united force and show the world what the workers can do. And then she dies a few months later, uh, passes away in December of, of 1930, and is truly mourned by laborers. Her funeral is carried here in Chicago on WCFL, the radio station, the voice of labor. Um, and and, and it's, her funeral is talked about in newspapers all over the country. And, and she's buried in Mount Olive, finally, with tens of thousands coming out for her, for her funeral. We're in Mount Olive in uh, Union Miner Cemetery. Um, 
where Mother Jones is buried and the Mother Jones Memorial is. With uh, uh, the gravesite here and, and the monument is three martyrs from the Battle of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun was about uh, the United Mine Workers had just uh, bargained a contract with all of the coal companies in Illinois so that they had one contract for all the mines instead of bargaining separate contracts with every mine. It was the Verdun Coal Company in Verdun that wouldn't honor that. The mine decided to uh, operate with uh, labor brought up from the southern part of the country and uh, UMWA miners from throughout central Illinois rallied to support their locked out friends here in Verdun. That was kind of the background to what culminated here uh, with a, a gunfight, unfortunately, on October 12th, 1898. There were 13 men killed in probably about 15 minutes of heavy gunfire. So there were four men from the Mount Olive area killed here and they were buried. Well, actually they were turned away from the Mount Olive City Cemetery. The, for some reason the folks down there didn't feel like these men deserved to be buried in uh, their own cemetery. So that led to the creation uh, of a Union Miner Cemetery that I think is a one-of-a-kind cemetery here in the United States today. And when Mother Jones uh, sent her last will and testimony, she made certain in there that she wanted to be buried with the brave men of Illinois, and that's why. There's a reason that Mother Jones is still alive in the world. Sometimes she goes dormant, but she always comes back. The reason is that her message is a universal one, and she said it in such a way, with her life and in her words, that resonate with anyone who sees the injustice that is all around us. There are no boundaries to what she did. She is most affiliated with the labor movement, but her message resonates with anyone who has been poor, who has battled to try to make life better. She is an international person in my view and deserves to have an international reputation. I think that for those of us who care about her in Ireland and the United States, we need to continue to build who she was and what she stood for. She dealt with the poorest people. She knew four presidents. Uh, she moved in all kinds of circles. Um, she spoke almost on her deathbed of creating a grander civilization, which is a beautiful phrase. She had a dream where working people would um, be treated fairly, be treated honestly, that they would uh, own the means of production themselves. Um, and like it's a dream that many people still hold. So the spirit that she represents, the spirit of community, the spirit of taking care of each other, the spirit of not being afraid to stand up for human rights still echoes today and is why many, many workers in this country still look to Mother Jones as a symbol of someone who does the impossible and makes it possible by standing up for working people and their families and their rights. And, and we're living now in a period when we're seeing the wages of families stable, stagnating, declining. We're seeing a wider and wider gap between the richer and poor in America, in Ireland, in Europe, around the world. Uh, and we're also seeing in America, especially unions being gutted. And so this is, this in some ways, even as she's not as well known as she once was when she was so famous a hundred years ago, maybe this is her moment coming. Um, maybe this is the time for Mother Jones, who told us that workers have to organize, they have to do for themselves, they have to take care of themselves, regardless of, never mind ideology among different sects, parties, labor unions, workers have to do it for themselves. She represents the nature that our ability to create a better world is really international, and for the first time we probably have the opportunity to do that. With so many people uh, sinking into poverty in this country at the moment, and poverty that's relative to our standard of living now, you know. And I said, like, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a, a woman like Mother Jones in Ireland today 
I think we could rock this uh, establishment to the core, you know. So Mother Jones is more than alive for us today. You know, there's a board here, and I'm always inspired by the notes and messages that people leave, you know, messages of, of uh, solidarity with you, Mother Jones, to plaintiff calls for, we need you more than ever, Mother Jones, today more than ever. Uh, I think it's still a legacy that, that speaks to people. She was a woman, I think, that Cork people should be extremely proud of. The amazing thing was that she was forgotten completely in Cork, other than a small paragraph in the examiner, Cork examiner at the time, in the 2nd of December uh, 1930, her debt went uncommemorated. And she was really forgotten about until uh, 2012, when the Cork Mother Jones Committee unveiled the plaque on John Redmond Street uh, in her honour and created a festival known as the Spirit of Mother Jones Festival in which we commemorate her fiery passion and oratory and her defence of working people uh, every year and we're very proud to do so. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me, as I went walking that ribbon of highway. I saw above me the endless skyway. I saw below me the golden valley. This land was made for you and me. Come on. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. I roamed and rambled and followed my footsteps to the sparkling sands of a diamond desert. All around me, a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From Cal